Have you ever wondered how can you start using blueprints without any previous knowledge? Coding can be an intimidating subject and most people think they don't have what it takes to be able to code anything. The goal of this tutorial is to give you solid fundamentals and tools to make your coding journey easier and realize that the only obstacle of learning blueprints was deciding when to start. When you finish this course, you will become confident with your coding skills learn the best practices to script your games and a solid scripting fundamentals that will let you understand sample projects that Epic Games release from time to time. And before I forget, if you want to support us in any way, be sure to check out our store. We have a lot of cool stuff like a free blueprints course, another to model a castle inside Unreal, and our marketplace assets that were made with care and effort. Now, let's continue. Let's start with a brief introduction to Unreal Engine. What we will see is what is a game engine and the details of specifically Unreal Engine, right? Because that's what, why we're interested in this topic. We need to know this foundation in order to understand all that we're going to do in the next videos. And, well, it's good to know who am I. My name is Raman Ampurizaga. I'm a game developer, educator, and C++ programmer. And while also a dog enthusiast, it's important to, to mention, right? Also, I'm currently an authorized instructor, partner for Epic Games. I'm not associated with them in any way. I do not speak for them, but they have authorized me to give classes, courses, and other education stuff. And well, you can find me in these, in these um, links. So what is a game engine? Let's get to the point really quickly, because this is a brief introduction. A game engine is a framework and a tool set that can be used to develop interactive experiences. This used to say games, but a real engine now does a lot more than just games. There is virtual production, uh, architectural visualization, movies. So yeah, it's a tool set and a framework. And inside these tools, we have an audio engine, render engine, physics engine, now called Chaos, input manager, AI system, and many, many more. All of these are integrated in the game engine and it's referred to a game engine but in the case that of unreal like i said you can craft any experience that needs to be in real time so any game engine will be a framework because every game engine has their own internal structure and a tool set it will be the tools that the game engine provides in the case of Unreal, the way the, the workflows uh, goes is th through importing stuff to the, to the Unreal Engine. You, you will probably create 3D models, characters, textures, animations, audio in external software and then import it to Unreal. But with Unreal 5, this is it's start being less the case because you can model inside Unreal, you can create animations inside Unreal. You now with meta sounds you can create the audio uh, procedurally inside Unreal. So it's this graph will continue to change as more tools get added to Unreal. And after importing all these assets with Unreal Engine, you can use the physics engine, audio processing, level design, uh, blueprint scripting to create more functionality to make it so the texture that you use can change colors or react depending on, on, on some gameplay or project mechanic. So Unreal Engine is a full suit of integrated tools for developers to use to design and build games, simulations and visualizations. While many assets can be developed from within Unreal, and this is increasing, 
the number of assets that you will be able to do with Unreal, it will probably increase uh, as, as time passes on. But most of them are created externally through tools like 3ds Max, Blender, ZBrush, and more. So let's start. Let's start talking about Blueprints. And this will also be a brief introduction to Blueprints because we want to start programming in Blueprints as fast as we can. But in order to do that, we need to have a solid foundation. So in this presentation, we will talk about scripting, we will talk about building gameplay functionality, and a little introduction to Blueprints. Uh, this is the funda foundation quote, so yeah, it's really important. You already know me if you watched the first video. So let's talk about the scripting. You will see that video games, or well, most of any real-time application is not only about the art. There will be art elements, but if you j just use them, you will probably end up with uh, something like a muse museum that no nothing will move and there will not be any interaction. So it will be the mixing of the art elements and the code and the scripts that will allow us to create gameplay mechanics and, well, create interaction. So how would we build that gameplay functionality? Well, in Unreal, you do that by using C++ code or Blueprint script. And learning Blueprints will be a first step to learn how to use C++ with Unreal because most of the functionality that you can uh, use through blueprints, it can also be used in C++. So you will remember most of the functions and most of the workflows. But what are blueprints? Well, they are, like it says, is a visually scripted additions to our game. And that additions are through notes that you can add in in graphs, and they are used for various purposes to implement behavior and functionality. This is how a blueprint editor will look like, and this is the blueprint visual scripting system. It's called a visual scripting system because we are drag and dropping nodes, and through these nodes, they each contain behavior that we can mix and match as we like. So, it uses a node based interface to create gameplay elements and it is used to define object oriented classes or objects in the game. This is a programming term that it just means that we are trying to represent stuff through objects. For example, if I wanted to create a car in my game, I'm not like defining it in a global class or in a in an unrelated script where I will have the I don't know acceleration or if it can turn to a right or to the left. The way we program stuff is by associating functionality and behavior. So if we want a car, we need an object that represents a car. And that's why it's called object oriented. Otherwise, all this code would not be in one class. And whenever we say class, we will probably uh, be referring to blueprints and it will be an interchangeable term, like classes and blueprints. If we have a blueprint that represents a door, then inside it, I would want to store if the door is open, how fast can it be opened, and also the functionality to open it or close it if we need it, right? 
that that is why it's called object oriented all the design is being thought as objects and how can we develop it modularly so it can be reused later so that's a good first step let's get to know more about blueprints by actually playing around with them let's create a project that we can use for our learning so let's click on games blank is fine blueprint desktop maximum without the starter content and ray tracing so this is good enough i'm gonna call it blueprints quick start and well you can select the project location let's create and let's wait a little bit and this is the unreal editor let's dismiss this and update the project the u project perfect so now with this unreal editor we will have a lot of ways to create blueprints you have even a blueprints button you want to create a blueprint new empty blueprint class and we will see a windows that tell us to pick a parent class because blueprints is object oriented then there is the concept of inheritance which means that you can define parent classes and then use these parent classes to create another class based on that class for example if i created a vehicle class then i could create a car class that inherits from the vehicle and in the vehicle i will probably put properties like how many how many tires it uses how many doors the vehicle has and, and stuff like that so whenever i create a class a child class then i do not do not need to do um, the same stuff all over again the same logic applies to this unreal already gives us a lot of parent classes and to know which one to use would be better if we examine the gameplay framework but for now we just need the actor one because in this series of videos we will create a little coin pickup well this was one way of creating a blueprint the other one we can go to a content drawer if we press control space and here is my content folder it's not a good idea to have assets floating around the content folder it's usually a best idea to create a folder of the project that this one is called Blu blueprints quick start there it is and inside it for now we can create a folder called blueprints now if i wanted to create a coin pickup then let's do it right click it blueprint class and here an actor like it says an actor is an object that can be placed or spawned in the world our world is this the level and an actor it can be anything that you can drag and drop on it so let's select an actor let's call it bp from for blueprints and here coin pickup let's open it and before opening it we can already use it in the map we can drag and drop it because it's an actor and we can place it so great let's double click to open it and this will be the blueprint editor interface Here in our Blueprint Editor interface, we have a lot of stuff. Let's analyze it little bit by little. The first thing we're going to talk about is the tabs we have here. We have three. The viewport, 
the construction script, and the event graph. Our viewport will show how our blueprint will look like in the map. So if and in our viewport we have this image, then in our map we also have this image. The construction script will be really helpful to create functionality when the blueprint is being constructed. And this will make sense in a little bit, don't worry. And the event graph is the main graph where we will add most of the code for the gameplay, mechanics, and the interactions. Now, this event graph will contain nodes, the same as the construction script also will contain nodes. And we will um, use this types of nodes, in this case, these types are called events, events trigger something, and using them will be the way we will create functionality. Now, before going to the next topic, it's very useful to know in case, for example, you close all the tabs, if you want to find a viewport, you can go to window, viewport. If you need to, to go to the construction script, you will find it here in the My Blueprint tab, construction script. And if you want the event graph, it's also here in graphs, event graph. And you can open them, like right click and open in new tab, so they don't override themselves. And you can have it as it was before. So let's talk about the elements of the Blueprint Editor. The first one is the menu. It houses most of the common functionalities that you can find here in Blueprints. Just to show off a little bit of them, the most useful ones will be here in the file, Refresh All Notes, Repair in Blueprint, and Compile. Uh, Open Asset is really useful you can go and use the control p in everywhere it's really useful for example here control p and i can find my my coin pick up really fast here in, in edit find in blueprints or find are also really useful in order to find an exact event maybe you want the begin play here you can find it begin play double click it and it will jump to it the asset, you, will, you can find this asset in the content browser. If, if you lost the location, you can find it easily. And these are tools for optimizations that we can go over later. The view one, uh, you can show unused pins, all pins. We will talk about it later also. Debug will be useful whenever we want to debug the blueprints. And Windows, like we said, you can make appear windows that you lost or that you closed even though you didn't want it yeah accidentally then you can find it on windows tools open more tools you can create c plus plus classes here more windows for debugging and will help you can track a bug The next element is the toolbar. This one is the toolbar. And they house most of the important functions here in the blueprint. The first one is compile. Compiling means that Unreal will process all the logic that we have entered here. And if there is an error, it will jump to the error. We have options here like save on compile to save on success only or on always. You can use them. I usually don't because I always save first and then compile in case Unreal crashes. And with Unreal 5, it's really... Right now, I'm using the early access. So it tends to crash a lot. So I usually just save. And this option is also here, file, save, or well, 
save all. But you can use it here also if you want to save every time you compile. This jump to error node is just a checkbox. So whenever an error node is detected, then we can find it easily. Great. Now we have the save, we, we have already used it. Browse is the same one as here in edit, excuse me, here in asset, finding content browser. If we click it, we will find it here in the content drawer. The next one is find. We already showcased that. It is the same bottom here, but it's easier just to click here. Hide related. Uh, let me activate all of these. Uh, can I right click it and activate them? No. Okay. So hide and related. Whenever we click on a node, we have these three nodes. It will make them will make the selection field and the other one it will give give them an opacity here to create a node in the event graph and i'm gonna jump a little bit to to, to that just right click inside the, the graph and you can choose any action to make for example actor no, i don't know get actor eyes viewpoint or right click and um, maybe i can i want to show some text in the screen print string and right now i'm using hide and related so whenever i click a node it will hide everything else if i connect this execution pin which is white then now these nodes are not unrelated so they stayed colored but if for some reason i connected this one then now everything is linked well if i click this one it doesn't have anything to do with the execution so it stays hidden we can lock the node state so we can click on anything else and the uh, the current state is maintained so let's uncheck that now the next one is class settings Here we have all the settings this class have and we can find the parent class. We can find it also here, but we can change the parent class here and reparent the blueprint. Also, it's a good place to place a blueprint description, display name if you want to change it for some reason, categories, and also add interfaces with which we will talk about later. The next one is the class defaults. And here we can edit the default values of this class. Let's remember that the parent class is an actor and an actor has already properties that helps us drag and drop it to the map, add some repl replication and more settings. So we can change them here. Whenever we add more variables to our blueprints uh, that we will also talk about later, we can change the, the default values here also. The next one is simulation that I, I can click. And what will happen here is that the viewport will reflect all the code that maybe we added in the construction script and in the event script. If we make it so that in the construction script, this generates some fences or in the event graph, it creates some asset then the simulation will create them and show them here. So it's good for pre-visualization. Um, and well, while you, you have this activated, you cannot change any value. So take that in, in consideration. Let's deactivate it. The next one is play. And we can press play. We won't see anything. But if we minimize this screen, then we have we can see this um, perspective. For the play, there are a lot of modes. We can, I usually use this new editor window, so it pops up and you can see the value that I printed here, this value. I, 
I can I could delete this and just tell it hello play hello perfect and if I wanted to see the execution of these notes I just have to select it from here you could probably it could probably no debug object selected but if we select our object then we can press play and you can see that the execution path is being highlighted so that's pretty good that's really useful now before going to the next element every time we change something in the blueprint like we said at the start we will need to tell the the editor to process it so we must click on compile if you press play it will compile for us but, as, but just take in mind that this isn't saving my blueprint so you could make it on success only and play and it will save for me oh it didn't but maybe if I click compile here now it saves but as, as I said before maybe you press play, play and something crashes it will not save so be sure to save and then compile and then press play perfect let's de delete some of this code and go to the next element of the blueprint editor interface that is the component this little tab will go hand in hand with the viewport and the blueprints are containers of components literally a blueprint isn't showing me anything and can't do anything by default a default scene root is added as a component and this is the component that lets us have a scale rotation and translation and lets us drag and drop a blueprint into a map now this will be a coin pickup so we can add components to make it look like a coin pickup for example we would need an static mesh of a coin which I do not have but I could add a component here an static mesh and add a coin mesh I believe there is a cylinder here yeah basic shapes cylinder you will see that there are a lot of components and you even can create more components to create a specific functionality for whatever you want to do I needed a cylinder now I have my cylinder and we will call it static mesh coin now I will rotate this and I will scale it in order for it to look like a coin that's more like it now we will, I will press save and compile and what this does is now in my viewport I see an static mesh of a coin which means that in my map I will also see the static mesh of this blueprint and I could drag and drop more more of them for example counter drawer BP coin pickup I can draw I, I, I can place more of them now whenever we're working with components we need to know which one is the root component in this case it will be the top the top one so it's the default scene root the root component can only be changed in scale because the rotation and the location are being changed in the world this means that any other component that is attached to the scene root we can change the relative location so if I wanted to change the relative location I can just select the component and here in, in my viewport I, can I will select the component press W for the transformation widget E for the rotation widget or R for the scale widget 
you can change them also from here and well Q for selection Q so maybe I want to place the blueprint and not be overlapping the the ground well I could make it so I move this static mesh a little bit higher I could also change it from here the location and now I will compile save it whenever I drag and drop the relative scale of the new ones I'm sorry the, rel the relative location of the new ones has been changed and on, on the old ones also so having a blueprint will help us make one change and it being propagated to every other blueprint now for now i will leave it like this i also need a way for my pickup to be picked up so let's also create a component to handle the collisions this one is called collision and i want a sphere collision now whenever we add a component it will attach itself to the component currently selected in this case it was the static mesh coin sometimes you want this behavior because whenever a component is attached to another if i move the parent then the other components attached will also move so that's that's really useful but in my case well, I moved the coin, for, so for now it, it's it's good enough, but if I wanted to unattach it, then I just need to drag and drop on top of the component, I want to detach it, and that's it. Now whenever I move the coin, the sphere won't move. And I will try to position my sphere as at best as I can. For now, let's leave it there. And, and yeah, let's continue. The next element is the My Blueprint tab. And here we will find every little detail this blueprint has. If we click this drop down on the event graph, we will find, and let's double, double click the event graph, we will find every event that is being contained here in this graph. We can add more graphs and we'll talk about that later. There are also functions. Our construction script is being considered a function and we could add more right here. Also, because there is a parent, here is the parent class, the actor, we can override functions and here it will show from where is the source of this of this function so we can override them just press click in this case it has created an event that will override and this event maybe i can do a right click add call to parent function and now i'm calling the functionality that exists inside the parent class that is the actor but let's not bother with that now we can create macros. We will learn how to use macros eventually. Don't worry. But we can create it here. Variables. And variables are the way that information is being stored inside a blueprint. It's like a little box that contains information. Let's create a variable. For example, I want to know how many coins this blueprint, well, this coin pickup should give me. Let's create a variable called number of coins to give so a little, a little tip about naming variables they should reflect on what they are storing and it should be really clear whenever I read a variable for the purpose that I'm using it for example, if this variable was called just x, is x what? 
x numbers, x coins, x delay before another coin appears. You really don't know. And many people could name this whatever and then add a tooltip, but it's a lot better if the name, even if it's longer, gives you a, gives you a good idea or well, if it's literal, in our case, it's really, re really literal. So it's number of coins to give. Then it's easier to understand. Now, we said that it was a box where we can store information. And in this case, I want to have a number. So we need to define a type for this variable. In this case, these are the most common and most used types. Here we have booleans, if we want a true or false, it will store it. We have integers that we're gonna use in this case because I don't really need to give like one and a half coin. If I needed to use decimals, we can use floats or doubles. A strings will be used for characters, or a, a string of characters, so we can write stuff in in the engine and do operation on them, maybe separate them by the middle or append text to it. And then we have vectors. They are really useful to save locations. The rotator is like a vector, but useful for rotations. And the transform is just a, ve a vector, a rotator and an other vector that it's similar like we have here in, for example, the sphere. This is a transform, location, rotation, and scale. So now I have created my variable. And here in the functions, I also want, want to create the function called picked up. And you, you will see that here it is just open a tab with the function I just created. So here in this function, I could add more code. So yeah, let's go to the next. Oh, um, before going to the next element, here are the event dispatchers. We will talk about them later. And here are look in the case of the of, of functions, we can create local variables that only exist when this function is being run, is being executed. So that's good to know also. Let's talk about the details panel. Here are, is the detail panel and it will change depending on what I'm clicking. So let's go to a viewport. We see that this collision is really not, um, not working well with my static mesh. Here in the details panel, most of the components will have a transform that I can edit. I could scale it, maybe. But in our case, because it's a collision, this have a shape and I can change the radius. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put here a hundred. So the detail, the details panel will allow us to change the, well, details of anything that we select. Here I can change the skeletal mesh to any other mesh if I, if I had them. The materials, ticks, physics, collision, etc. Now, in the case of a function, we will have other stuff that we will talk about later, but we can set a description, category, keywords, compact note tag, pure, calling editor, a lot of good stuff. In the case of the variables, and here are the components as, as variables, but they are the same. So let's not get to worry about them. In the case of my variable, here I can set the default value, but first I need to compile. Now it defaults to zero, but we can add more or less. Also, we can change the name. We can make it an array. 
we can make it instance editable that we will do probably uh, yeah let's do it now what this does instance of editable let's compile and save make makes it so i can edit this value this value per instance what am i talking about with instances so this is the blueprint class whenever i am using in a map this class it gets loaded in the in, in memory so whenever the the level needs to create a, the class it doesn't load the class again it's it creates an instance of it so this is an instance this is another instance of the same class and another instance this makes a a good use of the memory so by having instances it doesn't mean that every coin will work the same we enable instance editable so whenever we click a blueprint we can go to the detail panel and here in the details panel i i can pick and choose my components let's just pick, pick the the main one and here in the default i can change the number of coins this this coin will be for example this will be 5 this will be 10 and this one will be 1 and I'm gonna press end so I can snap it to the to the to the ground so each instance even though they are the same this value can be changed and well <laughs> everything that we we see here can change by instance but if I needed that all the coins change to to 10 for example then I would need to change it here in the blueprint let's talk about the construction script here let me put the example of we had the pickups this one give me one coin this one five and this one ten and I wanted to represent it visually right so let's open the blueprint we can right click and edit it and we can modify it we could create multiple bl blueprints that can change the scale or because there are blueprints and instances I could also go here click on the component and change the scale also and let me put this lock and then change the scale I could do this but I want it to be this scale to be driven by and let's click on my BP coin itself by the number of coins so whenever this number of coins maybe now is one if it's five it should be bigger uh, and, and maybe it should be a little smaller let me press play and yeah maybe it should be yeah, let's leave it like that so how could we do that well let's open it i just used ctrl e and here in the construction script what will happen is that this script will be run before the game begins and also it will be run every time a property changes if i'm using it in the editor what this means is let's add our a node that just prints a value print and it can say hello I, i'm gonna make it say the number of coins that we have in this case this is our variable for the number of coins that it will give so i can drag it and drop it to my construction script graph and get that number gonna connect it and we find this conversion node and it's because this node receives a string a string of characters so we can type it on the on the screen but this variable is a number an integer so this does the conversion between the number and the text now let's compile it 
and you see that it ran one time because it was the first time that this new logic has been added. So here I can press play and you probably won't see anything because the construction script has already run. But if I change any property on any of these blueprints, the value will run again. Well, the script will, will run again. So I can change the, the location. And I'm not seeing the, the script. It is running coins, it's printing to screen. Well, let's check the log. To open the log, let me put windows and output log. And we have it here. Let's clear the log. If we change a value, then it give me the, the action of printing a string that it has the number of coins to give. If I change any value here, then it should be say five and this should be, should be 10. This also means that if I change the number of coins here, it will reflect that change. So that's how the construction script runs. In our game, the construction script will run before the game executes. And in that case, we would see the, these debugs. Every time we press play, uh, we, we would see them here. In our case, in the editor, the, the logic has already run. So it doesn't need to worry about it again. So let's go back to our blueprint coin and you can call this screen by using control and then shift and here uh, we don't want to print to the log again we want to change the scale of this component so that component is called static mesh coin i'm gonna drag and drop it here and i need to change the the scale value so here scale well it's called scale so let's change the scale i can type scale and whenever we are doing this action of dragging from a pin it's good to know that this checkbox is active because this means that it's content sensitive and if it's context sensitive all the actions that i can do here will be valid if it wasn't, then there are a lot of stuff, for example, AR alignment, may, maybe it, it hasn't, do, hasn't anything to do with my static mesh coin. So you can deactivate it for more advanced stuff if you already know what you want. But I usually have it checked because it helps filter a lot of the stuff inside the engine. So here, let's search escape. Set mass scale, that, sound, that doesn't sound like it. Let's go a little bit further. Here we have get world scale, set relative scale, or set world scale. In our case, we're gonna work with relative uh, scale because that way, for example, if we set the scale here, it says for the coin, and let me delete delete that if we put it like 0 0.5 what this will mean is well now i have connected this relative scale let's compile and now it has changed the scale but in our map if I scale this blueprint from the from the origin, well, from the root parent, root component, then because we are using relative scale, it's also scaling with this static mesh. If we were to use world coordinates here, and let's do it again, but instead of set relative scale, 
set world scale and I'm gonna feed it the same values Now, if I compile, my blueprint will stay the same, but in my map, even though I have scaled this blueprint, it stays the same scale because we're using the world scale and not the relative scale. This is just a thing to take in consideration. I just need the, the relative scale. And it will depend on the number of coins I can I can uh, give, right? So maybe my maximum value would be 10. So I can, here in my detail panel, I can set a slider range and a value range so it can be validated. I could put 10 here and one. So whenever I try to put, I don't know, 30, it, it gets validated. 0, it goes to 1, and on a slider range, I can also do the same stuff. So 1 and 10, and now I can slide it from the minimum value uh, to the maximum value. So it's a neat stuff to have. Perfect. The default value should be 1 though. Let's compile again, save, and now we have in, in our example, three sizes, right? One is, and let me return this to, to the normal scale. We have a coin that can give us one, one that can give us five, and one that can give us 10. And let's say there, there won't be any, any coin that can give us any other number. So what we could do is here, drag and drop from the new scale and select and use the node called select. That's that's it. And we can do it like this. We have an index, we have different options. And if it's one, well, if it's zero, let, let's put it one. Let's call this a default value. If it's one, it will use this value. And the thing about doing it like this, uh, we can add options a pin. Is that it's gonna be like really uh, gross because, for example, option five, that's five coins, right? Let's put it like one point. 25 and let's copy and paste that value and for option 10 let's do it like 1.5 and let's copy and paste the value so now let's compile it let's go to the viewport 1 gives me a value of 1 Oh, and this is being changed, I, I believe. Yeah, it should always stay at 0 0.25. So even though we we could change the value here, you will know that uh, our viewport is not updating because the construction script is running. And it's always setting it to 1. So this should be like this, construction script. It's always running because I changed something here. So the C value should be, yes, the C value, yeah. The C value should be 0 0.25 and the same for the other ones and the same for this one. So now, oh, let's, let's compile. And I, I said the, the option zero, but not the option one, because remember, this is one. If this would be two, it would be zero. So let's, let's check it out. Number coins to give one, two is zero, three, zero, five. It gets bigger. And then it gets 
a little bit bigger. We can compile, save it, and then here we will be able to, to see the values, for example here 5, and for example here 10 again. It changed because I went to the, I, I set the default number of coins, like I, I changed it too much, so it affected everything. So now we have this behavior. Now, I could go to the next step that we're, we're going to see the event graph, but I want to get a cleaner implementation here. So a cleaner way to do this, and this is a good place to talk about. Oh, yeah, let's 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 leave it for, for later. Let's leave it for later. We, it, this is a quick start, so let's not worry too much about it. We'll clean this up. Don't worry. Let's go now to the event graph. We, we now have the grasp of the construction script. And I already promised that we will clean this up. But let's go to the event graph. Here is where most of the functionality will exist. What do I mean with this? is that here will be all the nodes that will trigger when something happens and all the logic that will happen when well something happens so now let me close the find results and the compiler results for now so i have more space in my in my window and let's create uh, the functionality to pick up this uh, well, pick up. Now, we need a way to know if my character, let's press play, if my character goes near this pickup and whenever it overlaps with my collision, it sh something should happen, right? So for that, we have a collision component. Let's go to my collision. And here, in the viewport, I can select my collision component. Every component can have event dispatchers. So we can find all the events that the component has. And here we have, for example, on component hit, on component begin overlap and overlap, and many, many more. So what we need right now is just the begin overlap because I want to do something when my character begins overlapping. Let's press here in the plus sign and it creates a red node. This is called an event and these events will be triggered by something. Something is calling them and they are the start of any execution uh, of the of any logic that will we will have here in this case my sphere collision if we just leave our our mouse inside um, it's already a class that exists in c++ and in c++ they are validating all the collision stuff so whenever we are over, overlapping this sphere then something can happen right and we can test it print let's print a hello play i'm gonna go near and it says hello it says hello again and again and again perfect now this is um like an event from a component but maybe i wanted to to, to to function with any component. If I wanted to do that, maybe I could have another collision. I don't know. I'm going to duplicate this with Control W. If I wanted a collision right here, what I would need to do is here in the collision, I could add, I could add a begin overlap and do the same stuff. 
Or I could also just right click here and every actor has a begin overlap. Actor begin overlap. And this just says that something has overlapped with this actor in general, with any of the components of this actor. And it only gives me which actor collided with and that's all the only thing that I need for now. Let's not complicate stuff. So I'm gonna delete my other sphere collision and let's use event actor begin overlap let's connect it again with the hello and let's press play it says hello perfect if i wanted to fake the the functionality of picking the the coin up i could yes drag and drop this static mesh coin and I can set it to visible to set visibility new visibility and change it or but and but if I had another static mesh then I would need to do exactly the same or I can do just set hidden in game let me type here set hidden in game set actor hidden in game let's put it like this and new hidden true this will hide all the components inside this actor let's press play and now whenever i collide with this it hides it it still has its collision but we can get around that by doing something similar like set actor collision set actor enable collision and let's put it to new actor enable collision false perfect play and now there is a collision and it gives me the the feeling that i already picked up the stuff excellent Now let's create a custom event to play a sound. So whenever I pick the blueprint, the pickup, then I know that something is telling me that something happened apart from seeing it disappear into the thing air. Let's first, um, no, yeah, it, it, it's okay. It's okay. Let's first create the custom event. At custom event and I'm gonna call it play pickup sound here this is an event created by us which means that nothing else is gonna call this if I leave it like this then I I'm I'm screwed because nothing will call it. How do we call this event? Then we have to do it manually. Here I'm hiding the coin. So here I should play the sound, play pickup sound. Now, whenever this event triggers, it will call my custom event. And my custom event for now, it could say print ding play and it says ding let's actually play a sound here in my content drawer i have nothing <laughs> not not even one sound so let's add a sound here i'm gonna add the add feature or content pack and i'm gonna go to content packs here is the starter content it contains a lot of assets Let, let's press add to project it have materials it has also sounds particles meshes so it's a good start like it says it's a starter content now i'm gonna open the content drawer and i can see that the start 
starter content here has an audio and here in the audio I want maybe I don't want the explosion because it's, it's too too loud let's play it that's it's too much it's, it's definitely too much maybe the explosion here yeah it could it could work it could work maybe light no Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. The explosion is fine. I believe it's the only one that d don't loop and and won't scare me. So let's play a 2D sound. For now, let's play sound. If we play a 2D sound, then it will be like playing a sound from a menu. Maybe I should play sound at location. Yeah, that should be better. Sound at location. If we add it attenuation it would work here I need to select a sound content drawer explosion cue and now I can press the arrow or I, I could select it from here but that way is fast I need a location and do I need anything else ah, that that's that's too much setting I only need the location and I want it to play from the center of this blueprint so let's get my actor location And I'm gonna connect it like this. This will play a sound from the center of my actor. Remember that this blueprint, its parent class, is an actor. So that's why I'm calling it an actor. Let's compile, save it, and play. So now, whenever I, I get the blueprint, it plays the sound. Let's talk a little bit about functions. Here we, we created a pickup function that we should use when the actor is picked up. And this is my event that is trigger, triggering my pickup logic. So let's use it. Let's just drag and drop this function. We can find it from here also. Picked up. Here it is. And I'm going to put this logic inside my function. We can do it like this and copy and paste, double click on my function, paste it here. And now it will work exactly the same. Or I could also, and this is this one is easier, let's delete my pickup function. I'm gonna select every node I want inside the function, right click it and collapse to function. I'm gonna call it pick up. I'm gonna call it the same. And now if I double click my my new function, I will have the notes here. Pretty cool, right? So now I can um, do some stuff with my function if I needed to to change the behavior, maybe I do, do not want to be an overlap, maybe I want to interact with the pickup, I don't know, like press E to, to use the, the pickup, then I could just create the event, maybe I want to press E, uh, this keyboard, and here there is the letter E, when I press it, I want to pick it up, so I just, I can just copy and paste it and it will work. So we should have exact, exactly, yep, 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 exactly the same thing right now. Now we know how to use events and how to use functions. So what's the big difference about it? First, events can't return a value. What do I mean by this? If I here I called play pickup sound, it it seems like o almost the same, right? But here in my function, I'm gonna click on it. 
there are inputs. Maybe I want to add some new input here. Perfect. The event can do exactly the same. But if we wanted to return a value, maybe if, I don't know, the number of coins it was picked up, I could also create an output in my function and change it to an integer. For example, I cannot do that with an event. And well, let, let me enter the function. Now we have a return node that I need to connect. Otherwise, it probably will be an error or it may return zero for a value. So I can change it to maybe three or whatever, right? Or this number of coins to give. I'm not going to do it. That, that was just an example. But my function can return values. Let me delete everything I have done. The event, there it is, perfect. Why is it that my function can return values and my event can't? It's because when it, whenever I call a function, and let me delete this pickup sound, whenever I call a function, I'm, I know for a fact that it will be all calculated and execute it or run on the same frame it was called. So if we were in frame, I don't know, 10, and I called pickup, before the frame ends, this function will run all of its code. Even if it's calling an event, what this is doing is just telling the event to run. But an event, does not give me the same security of of the function that it will finish running on the same frame. Why? Because an event can't be delayed. Here I have a node called delay and I can run more stuff. So I don't really know when this custom event will end. And that's fine because if we wanted to know that this, this functionality needs to run on the same frame, then it would probably best suit it to a function. Inside a function, I cannot call a delay because everything that runs here will finish on the same frame that has been called. So as an example, and oh, well, like I was saying, even though I'm calling the event, I'm just telling it to run. I'm not expecting anything for, from the event. Let's, let's create a little uh, respond behavior. We, we already know that we can pick it up. Perfect, with my explosion sound. So let's create a custom event called respond pickup. And here, I'm gonna create the a little um, the, the code that I need in order for it to pop up again. That will be the, here in the pickup. This hides my pickup. I could create a function out of it. So let's do it. Right click it, function. And it's a function because I know that whenever I tell it to hide, then I want it to be processed on the same frame. I don't want to wait anything for it to hide. So let's call it toggle visibility and collision. And the same naming convention as the variables is more useful to have a longer name I can glance at it and understand it quickly. So here I'm calling it toggle visibility and collision. And I'm calling it toggle because we can add, we don't need to create a one, one function to hide and another, and another one to show. 
we can just add a new input here and we can call it um, height maybe yeah we can call it height or shoot height let's compile it and now with that variable I can do here what it's called the same stuff that I did here a select but instead is a select of a boolean so select and here it should be fairly easy to understand should hide if I wanted to hide the new hidden if this is true then it should be true because new hidden will be true and if it's false then it's okay because the I don't want it to hide and it will pass it a false value to enable the collisions something very similar and I'm gonna see if maybe it's too similar if I wanted to hide the collision should be not enabled and if I wanted to show this will be false so the collision should be enabled so now I can connect it like this and I'm gonna use some reroute nodes in order to fix this it's not fixing it's just a matter of personal preferences it's useful not to cross the wires so I can double click on a wire and a reroute now node will be created let's create another one and do something like this now it's a little bit cleaner let's compile toggle visibility let's use this function now on pickup toggle visibility should hide yes whenever I want to respawn this pickup respawn pickup I could call toggle visibility and collision and I should hide it should be false now how could I test this event without programming anything else the events have uh, a little advantage over the functions uh, that adv advantage is called call in editor I'm gonna select the event the respond pickup event and the call in editor if I click on check click on it compile what well, save and compile now we can click on any of our blueprints and in my default values I will find a respawn pickup button it won't happen it, it won't change anything for now but let's here select viewport I'm gonna pick up this coin and I'm gonna leave the area and now I'm gonna press shift F1 so I can regain mouse control now I, I can oh, let's press shift F1 again and I'm gonna press this eject button that looks <laughs> really similar to an eject button for CDs and what this does is detach the player controller so now I'm a floating camera it's just like like uh, using the editor but the game is in execution this allows me to select the floor select my blueprints and my pound that in this case is this uh, little sphere and I could change everything maybe I, I can change the the movement the location etc but in my case here in my world outliner where everything inside my level will be shown uh, whatever is in in yellow it was created during runtime but my 
pickups are right here. My coin pickup 3 is right there, even though that is hidden from the word outliner, I can I can select it and I'm gonna press respawn pickup. And there it is. So my respawn functionality is working. Let's press again attach to the player controller and allow allows normal gameplay. I can probably pick it up again. Yeah, that's right. So it's working. I want it to respawn though. Let's go to my coin pickup and I wanted to execute this respawn after, after I don't know, maybe third, three seconds after picking it up. I can put it right here. Let's make a delay. Three seconds. And I'm, I can do it right here because this is an event. We are in the, in the event graph. If this was a function, then I couldn't. This would be not allowed. So now let's call my respawn. And now let's play again. And I'm going to select new editor window. Gonna pick up, wait three seconds, and it's back. Perfect. Let's talk about the most frequent events that we will find inside the event graph. The first one is the begin play that we already used. The begin play is called when the game starts, and we could check the execution flow of all Unreal, but what you need to know is, is after the level is loaded, the level being this level, the level loads, it creates all the, the actors that it needs, it initializes everything, and after everything is ready to start, then the begin play on all the actors start triggering. This means that if I put here uh, hello, we currently have how many? Three coins. It should print hello three times. And there it is. So here we usually put code for setting up some variables, creating more components if needed, or some behavior that we need to, to, to run um, not always like on construction because if we wanted to do that we have the construction script like like this one maybe you could put this here but is to run functionality that needs to be sure that everything else has been initialized is if for example this construction script needed a variable from another blueprint you will take the risk of the other blueprint not having uh, initialized the variables that you needed so maybe if you needed the number of coins of another blueprint it could return the default value like one even though it's five because it has not been initialized yet but if you wanted to do that then you would probably put it in the begin play so you are pretty sure that every value that you get from other classes is the right one. The other one, the other event that is really, really common and useful is the tick event. This is an event that triggers every frame, every tick. So if I put my print string here and this shouldn't crash my engine, but I really don't know. Let's put, press play. It would fill my screen with hello because every frame is that string is being typed. This is mostly avoided, <laughs> the, the tick event, because doing logic here, um, you really need to come with a good uh, excuse or a good reason 
for it to work in the event it, it's usually uh, used for animations animations and i'm not meaning like i have my skeletal mesh and i put an animation here no i i mean like little animations maybe i want to move that coin here well i need to know each tick how many units i want to move it and i can i i could do it like this something like this maybe A static mesh coin i'm gonna add a local local offset a relative location also is is fine and i'm gonna put one here i can connect it and whenever i press play i will see my my blueprints moving because every tick we are adding a relative location now this can be really tricky because maybe you have 10 uh, no, one one is okay but what happens when okay we're running and let me put this red what would happen with a machine that is running 60 fps and one that is running at low F fps here is running every tick so every tick is adding one if my x started on zero at the end of one second i have run it 60 times so i have added plus 60 here so x would be 60. in the case of this machine it has only run run 15 times so my x would be 15. this would mean that this gameplay mechanic is really connected and it it's being determined by the fps with which is really not like a good idea because it could probably be unfair to maybe a machine with high specs or could be unfair to low specs we want the same experience for everyone so you usually don't do that stuff like this uh, but if you wanted to to do it here in the event tick you need to take in consideration the delta seconds the delta seconds are the number of seconds that has passed between one frame the actual frame and the last one so if again i have two machines one faster than the other one if my delta seconds was 0 0.08 i can multiply it by one so in this frame i'm only adding it 0 0.08 but if my delta seconds were like really high, maybe uh, it was 0 0.5, this would be uh, the lower end PC. Then uh, uh, let me make this not 8. So it, it's. Uh, how can I delete this? So it's easier to understand. Maybe this could be 0, 01 and this could be 0, 05. Oh, let's make it a lot easier. 1 and 0, 05. So, in the span of 0 0.10 seconds, this have tick twice and this has tick 10 times. But because I'm going to multiply this value, the delta seconds, by my unit, in this case is 1, this will be 0 0.5 times 1, 0 0.5. Again, it will give me this value. And this will be 0 0.1 times 1 will be 0 0.1. So 
if I execute it 10 times, then it doesn't matter, it will return the same value. So the way to, to mostly fix is not a definite fix, but you can do it like this. Uh, let me right click here and we can show off the split functionality. Split. So a vector is just three floats. And I'm going to multiply this. Delta seconds by any number I want here. It could be one or it could be 10 even. Uh, let's put it five. So this way, it doesn't matter how many frames per second I'm executing this, it will always be the same movement on every computer. So that's a way we could, we could use the tick. Just to finish up talking about the tick, you could also disable the tick because maybe you don't, you're not really using it. And to disable it, we just need to go to class defaults, start with tick enable. Now, why would you do this? It's because whenever we're running Unreal during runtime, Unreal has a list of all the actors that need to, to tick. And if this actor is like the one we are using here, that the tick is completely completely empty, then we are iterating this list like one by one, but it it shouldn't go to this to this event tick because it's, there is nothing there. We don't need it. So it's an extra iter iteration, right? So that way we can optimize this, eliminate this class from the from this list and save a little bit of performance. A, and I, I mean, it's a little bit, but in the long run, it will help a lot. So start tick enabled. Let's remove the check, the check here and we can delete that tick because we're not going to use it. Let's talk about ways to control the execution time. Here, we will have three ways to do this. We will have delays, timers, and timelines. And we, we will use some of them for our pickup. Right now, our pickup is working <laughs> correctly. So let's talk about delays first. Let me open it. I pressed Ctrl E to open it fast. And in our case, we are already using delays here to respawn the pickup, which means that if we obtain it and wait three seconds, it appears again. So that's great. But the delays have some cases where they can misbehave and most of those cases are when we are using the same delays the same delay node more than once for example is if some other node here used this delay also i don't know here maybe What it will happen is that, let's say this executed first. This is the execution flow. This is flowing this way. Now it start the delayed node, right? So let's say there are 1.5 seconds before, uh, remaining in this delay before starting this respawn pickup. But this custom event gets played, or well, gets called before it ends. This will call this other event, and this will trigger again the execution of the delay. Calling the same delay more than once makes it so that the second call is ignored. 
and we can hover the, the delay and it, it, it should say yeah, call in again while it's counting down will be ignored. So this will not trigger twice. This may trigger only once. If we wanted to refresh this delay, so maybe if this hasn't finished and I want to call it again so I can refresh it, we can use something called retriggerable delay. Here it is. And when it's called again, then the countdown will reset, like it says here, just to take it in, a, in consideration. Something that we cannot do with these delays are cancel them. So, so if we call them, then they, they are going to be used. You can reset the timer by using a retriegable delay, but you cannot cancel them. If we wanted to cancel something, we needed to use timers. Timers work just as delays. And let's change this. Instead of using a delay, let's use the respond pickup. Uh, let's use the timer to call the respond pickup. So here, in order to use a timer, then you just need to set the timer. And you can set the timer by event or by function name. So if we needed an event, uh, I don't remember if this respawn pickup was an event. Yeah, it, it is an event. Then here we can hook up the, the event like this, but it's really messy doing it this way. So we can use this node called create event. And we, we could create another event or a function even and, and bind it to the timer or we can select any event in this drop-down list. Just remember that you cannot use an event that has an input with the timers. And the same goes when, when we talk about the timer by, by function, set timer by function name. Both of these, won't, you won't be able to use an event that has an input, for example, here. Let's add an, uh, any input. It, it doesn't really matter. New param here. Let's compile. Now, I cannot choose my custom event because it has an input. If we remove it, then things change and it should show up here, custom event. So our respawn event it works pretty pretty good because it, is, it, 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 it doesn't need a, a, an input. So it works really well. If we needed a function, for example, here I have a pickup, toggle visibility collision. If they don't have an input, then, well, this one has an input, so we cannot use it. We can type the function name here. And if we type a function that has an input, it will show us an, a little error or warning telling us that you can't do that. So let's replay this replace this code here, delay. Here is the duration. I can set it to three. I can even set it to a variable that it that would be a lot better. Promote to variable and let's call it time before respawning. Oh, whoops. Now with this variable, it 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 it's give it gives us a lot of flexibility, right? Let's compile it and we we can set it to instance editable so we can change it on every instance in our map if we want it for this one to respawn faster then i can go here on the default and change the value maybe i can set it to one and this one will respawn faster than this one um, this menu I'm, I'm using control shift no control tab in order to to open it it's a faster way to access stuff that is already open, right? And now we we'll, we do not need to do anything else. This will already work, and I double click that that create event. We have more stuff with the with the timers. Here we have a looping. If we need to trigger this every x seconds that we can set up here, for example, if if this was one, then 
every one second this function or this event can be called. We, ha we can add an initial start delay or, or a initial start delay variance. So we can add a random number before it starts. So pretty nifty stuff. But the magic of the events is that they also give you a way to access the event. So they give you this reference to the, <laughs> I'm sorry, to the timer. This, that is the magic of the timers. Now, with this reference, I can save it. Let's promote it to the variable and let's call it respawn timer. So what would happen if my game, I decided to put it on pause. So I, do, I really do not need to, to, to trigger this timer, right? We could, uh, let's, let's create like a, a little, another custom event and let's call it game is in pause. So when the game is in pause, this shouldn't be called, right? There it is. So when the game is paused, maybe I want to not respawn any other, any other pickup from this. So I can use this reference here, get, and I can also pause it. I can pause the timer by handle. So the timer will, if, if it was remaining one second, then it stays with one second. If I need it again, then I can unpause it. And if I needed to get rid of it, then I can clear and invalidate the timer by handle, which is really useful. It's really useful to have a lot more control on our delayed actions. And that's the second way to control our execution time or to control how we want the, the, our code at which time we want to execute it. And we can delete that response because we are calling it right here. It should be, oh, let me delete this. In the case of the pause, realistically, we would use something called pause game. Is game post set game post. And every actor can be affected or not by the post. So let's click even when post. So this way you can, well, if you pause the game, then the timer will not uh, keep running unless you have that activated. So let's not, not get too worried about it. Let's talk about the third way of controlling the execution time. The third way is through timelines. A timeline, let's create one right now. You, to create it, we just right click and type timeline. Here in timeline, you can give it a name. I will use it in this example for a little animation of my respawning um, pickup, right? So let's call it respawn animation. And this respawn animation, uh, it, it's better if you put a prefix like a T from for timeline. This timeline contains information that, that has values uh, determined by us inside a, a, well, a timeline. If you double click it, then we will see the timeline. We do not have any information, but we can create tracks in it. We can have a float track if we wanted just a value. You can right click and add a key, or you can control click, excuse me, shift click to add more keys. And you can have a curve here. And this curve, you can make, you can change the the tangents, linear, automatic tangents, you can move them. You can really get creative with all of this. The same as a float, there is a vector, but now you're playing with, with three values. Add key to all curves. If we need it, here are the three values. We can create events. So whenever this get, gets to this precise point, then an event triggers. And Every track will be controlled by the timeline. Here we can set up the length of the timeline. Usually you want it to set up at one, one second. So then we can change the play rate and get easier animations for faster or 
slower so usually you want the length to be one you can use the last keyframe auto play loop replicate it uh, this will be useful if you want to show behavior that your timeline have in a multiplayer game and you can ignore the time dilation here the time dilation will make our game run slower but if you you ignore it then this timeline will ignore it so let's do something with it let's not just talk about it ah and this the last one is color you can change like different colors colors here if you wanted a gradient you can drive a lot of stuff material colors with a timeline also if you want to change something in runtime it can be a good a good way to do it so let's right click on everything and delete it and what I want to do with this timeline is create a little animation because the timeline lets us have values inside a frame of time then it is easy to do uh, some little animation for example I want that when my pickup respawns I want the the coin to go upwards and rotate uh, so seems pretty simple right so let's do it the respawn pickup here we are toggling the, the visibility and collision and I also want to play this timeline this timeline we set it up with a length of one and this length will determine how long it plays for this track let's, let's call it uh, C movement and I'm not using a vector because I only want to move my my little coin in the C now right now if I go to my viewport and let's close these functions just to make it easier my animation what I want to do here is change the C location right now is in 60 so that that's the the final location I want to achieve I wanted to come from the bottom from zero and go upwards right to 60 so that's that's what I can do here at first at zero I want it to be zero then time zero and value zero and at one that it will be the last um, execution of, of my timeline then I can choose time one and the value should be 60 so now let's save it let's go back to the event graph and here now that I added a track in my timeline I have this new value that will be driven by the animation well by the execution of this timeline and if you are missing your other point then you can adjust the view or the curve to fit then how can I use this value well whenever we run a timeline we will have an update execution pin that will run every frame a finish execution uh, execution pin whenever the timeline finishes right that this one is one second in, le in length so after one second it will show finish and the direction will tell us uh, if we were going backwards or forwards let's yes equal in them forward backward and why do we have this because if we, if we wanted a opposite animation usually it's done when you are opening doors you only want to do animation one the rotating animation once and then whenever we close the door we can reverse the timeline we can call the reverse node and it will run from the current point to the um, to the end well to the start in this case and we will talk about this all, all these input nodes in a minute but let's first use this C movement we wanted to move this static mesh so let's grab the component and set the relative location and we have talked already about relative and world locations well coordinates in our case this blueprint houses this component this component has a 60 of relative location so it doesn't matter where it is in the world so with this now I can connect my C movement I do not need a vector here let me split it right click it split and let's connect the C movement let's press play and whenever I will call the respawn let's do it here oh uh, my yeah my 
my pickups are too too near to each other. They should call my respawn animation. There it is. That's my respawn animation. Now it doesn't play the second time because once it finished playing, it will get stuck here at the one. If we want it to be an animation that can be replayed, then we need to use play from a start. We can also stop mid animation, we can reverse it, we can reverse from the end or set a new time. But I usually don't, don't use this set new time because if we wanted to make the animation faster, we only needed to set up the play rate. How do we set up the play rate? Whenever we create a timeline, we will have it here on the components and we can drag and drop it. Let's get it. And we can set playback and excuse me, it's play rate. And the play rate will determine how fast it will go. If it's one, it's normal time. It's it. If it's less than one, then for example, if it's uh, 0.5, it will be twice as slow. But if it's two, it should be twice as fast. If it's zero, it won't play at all. Then let's press play. And we're, I, I already pick it up. And the animation should be faster. If we, if we want a faster animation, then we can, I don't know, maybe seven should be faster. And there it is, a lot faster. If I wanted to rotate it, then we can, um, we could change like this rotation, like this, and save the value and all that. A faster way to do it, because we're already updating a, a, a location here, we really don't, do not need another track. We could create it, you are free to do, do so, but, but in our case, we can add a relative rotation and I can choose the axis. Let's let's check what what axis do I need. It seems to be my role, which is my X. Then I can connect it like this in X. Let's add, I don't know, two. It may be too much. Let's see, play. And le let me let me change the play rate to something I will be able to see. And again, they should also be a variable. And let's open it, open the eye. So set the play rate. Let's see if it's working, this add rotation. Maybe two is too, too little. And that, that sound is really starting to get to me. But there it is, the two work. So maybe it's too, too little now. Play. And I'm sorry for the current explosion. So that's, that's cool, right? But yeah, let's, let's use uh, uh, another curve because it, it, it will be cool. Let's call it uh, roll rotation and let's call it new and let's Let's rename it and also call it new C location. So it's easier to understand whenever we come back to the code here. At first, I want um, what what could be a good effect from going um, from a high value to a low value, maybe. Yeah, let's let's try that. Let's call it 50. And then at the end, let's put it at zero. Oh, one. Yeah, there it is. And now we can add this value, new rotation. Let's use it here. Split it. Let's connect it to the roll. And there it is. Play. And now, yeah, pretty cool, right? But what would happen if I needed to change, for example, I wanted more rotation at the start. I could go here and change the value, right? Let's call it, I don't know, uh, 100. And it's all good because um, we are using like few values and yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. And the thing about that is that it can get really complicated if I had more values like, like this or uh, even cooler effects. 
I could select all my all my curves, all my points. And here right click auto just to get some nice looking tangents. Let's say that I am not good with one of those values, right? If I if I need to to make the change here, like now maybe a hundred it's is too much. I will run into the problem that yeah, okay, let's have it. Let's divide by two, then go again here and divide by two, and it's really a hassle. So we will use the same logic of why we had the length on one. We will change all our values to be inside one or minus one. For example, here the value is 60. Let's put it to one. And now, here in the event graph, because I know the highest value will be one. This new C location, we will multiply it, multiply it, there it is, by our highest value that was 60. Now, I can create this um, as a variable, and I will call it, um, what can I call it? Let's call it timeline. No, um, starting C location, because that's what it is, right? Yeah, and the same one for here. This way, every value will be on one, and we really just need to worry about the shape of the curve and not the values. And it will it will re really be faster to change. So let's also change this one here. This will be one. This will be. This was already zero. And now we can focus on our curves and here in the event graph we can focus on our values so that's a, a little a little better and it's easier because it's easier to customize because now i can promote this to a variable and let's call it highest expectation oh, value respond and it, it's it's usually a good idea to call our variables something that is easily understandable. In this case, these variables are being used for the respawn. So respawn anim start in C location. Sounds good. Or maybe it could be, it would be, not be the starting one. It would be the goal. And respawn highest rotation value. Yes, sounds, sounds good. And we can play around with a lot of numbers here, maybe 200. And I do not have to change the curve, which was a disadvantage at first. Yeah, pretty nice. With this, you just need to know that you can also pause without having to use these, these input nodes. You can get the component, get, you can pause. Oh, well. It's called a stop then, yeah, a stop. And change a lot of behavior that the, your current um, timeline could have. You can also play it, play from the start, play. You don't really have to use these nodes in order to have a, a working timeline. And if you wanted, wanted it to, st to play from the start, then you can auto play. And then whenever I hit play, then if you see the, if you saw the, the shadows then oh, let me put back here no that's not it you can see that my timeline auto plays which is pretty pretty nice let's talk about ways to control the execution flow we now know how to control the time of execution but our execution flow right now in our blueprint is pretty sequential which mean which means that whenever this event is called, then our picked up function will be called and then timer, and then we save the reference of that timer, right? And everything right now, if we just look at the white lines that are our execution lines, then we see that it is pretty sequential, which is fine. It keeps things simple, but 
it won't allow us to have richer interaction between our blueprints and the player or the game, right? So we have ways to control the execution flow. We can right click and type flow to find all the nodes that allow us to do that. And, and we will we will take a look of, of all of us, well, of all of them uh, in a minute. But let's look at the first one, one of the most basic ones. The first one is the branch. You can type it or you can press B and click and it will get auto created branch here. So our, our branch lets us branch the execution flow. We have a true value and a false value. This will be determined by the condition we have here. So, for example, if we put print here, in the true, we will say hello. In the false, we will say bye. Let me type bye. There it is. And I have two actors here. Let me delete. I will use control tab to open this little menu and pick up and um, pick my coin pickup right so right now the, con the condition is true let's press play it will be hello and if i change it to false then it will be bye so pretty nice right but right now my condition is pretty static because i am setting it we need to come up with ways to use this, this condition in order for to help us create better interaction. So how can we apply this in our coin pickup? Well, in one of the previous videos, I noticed that another that a pickup could pick up another pickup, right? So this pickup can pick up this coin. Let's play press play and it doesn't happen immediately because they are already created, so the begin overlap doesn't start. So whenever I pick up one of them, when it responds, it picks up the other one. And it will happen like that. So we would need to check that we are not picking up another pickup, right? That another pickup can be picked up. So let's take it easy and do a simple condition right here we have our actor begin overlap that it it, it it is being triggered by the sphere by this com sphere component a sphere collision component so i can move our event a little to the side and now use a branch node and if it's if it's true then i want it to be picked up and if it's false then you shouldn't pick it up. So let's check which, which class is the other actor that it is picking up this coin, right? So let's drag and drop this input. Let's, let's ask for the class. Let's type class, get class. And this class is, uh, the color is a shade of purple. Let's not get into a color debate here but for me that's purple and what it what it is is an actor class reference so we are not checking for the object we're checking for the class and the class is this this name right bp coin pickup so if it is equal i can compare here like this and I will compare it to my coin pickup. Here it is. Great. So like this, we can now connect this condition, but it won't work like this, right? Because I'm asking if this other actor has the same class as the BP coin pickup, as is the same class of my coin pickup, then I am picking it up. So this is not what we want to do. We want to do uh, that if 
any other class that is not my coin pickup, then we we can't pick it up, right? So if it isn't my coin pickup, then it should be picked up. We can solve it like this, like putting here in false, and it will work. Let's press play. Let's pick up one of them, and the other one shouldn't pick up. Yeah, that's right. But just as a quick um, tip that I wanted to give here, it is easier to read whenever we have positive logic. What that means is that every condition we are using, every branch, our true value should be our desired behavior, right? So we can also fix it like this by negating it. We can negate a boolean by typing not. So now it would read something like this. And I will put it like this. So if my class is not of the BP coin pickup, then it will be true. And I will pick up my stuff. Case the pickup work because our pawn, our character, is not of the BP coin pickup, and in the other case, when the co the other coin could have picked up the the this pickup, then it didn't happen. If you want to to not <laughs> to not use the not node, then most of the of the equals nodes, just as I type a double equal sign or you could type you could type equal you could also type a uh, exclamation equal to signify not equal and it would be the same like this i prefer like i said positive logic for me it's easier to know that every comparison i will make it will be a uh, equal equal and then you know, it is easier to see a not node than having to see here the, the, the symbol, like the exclamation point here. But that's just me and preferences. You, you really can, can do it however you, you feel comfortable. Let's talk about another useful node that will allow us to control the execution flow. And this one is more for organizing purposes. Let, let's see here. We have this toggle visible collision whenever we respawn the pickup. Toggle visibility and toggle the collision. So we can enable our collision and enable the visibility, right? That's what we did. And here we have something visual, right? We have the timeline and the add relative rotation. What would happen if we needed to type, uh, for example, hello at the end of the execution, right? Of this execution. We could add the node here and move everything around. We can put it at the end of this execution that is finished, but it will be at the end of the animation. And maybe we do not want that. The way we can organize this execution is by using the node called sequence. I can type flow and my sequence node should be right here, sequence. On, or you can also press S and click and there, there are sequence nodes. So the way I like to divide my code and it, it gets easier to read in the future is by separating code that is just for visual stuff like this one, I will click Alt, well, I will press Alt and click here to break the, the connection. And now I can use the sequence. The sequence allows me to know exactly how this execution will happen. So if something in zero gets connected, it gets executed before one. And I'll have it like this. 
Now, we have the same functionality, but we know that this one will execute first, and this one is code that has to do with the logic of the gameplay, right? And this is just visual stuff. So if we wanted to add something here, we can add it visually here. And if we wanted to add something for gameplay, I can add it right here. It's a really useful tool. You can add more pins here. You can add a pin between another pin. And you can remove also the pins by right clicking. So it's really, really useful. The next node in the flow category is the flip flop. Let's right click and use it flip flop. Here it is. And this node will work something like this. Whenever it gets called, it will run A. Whenever it gets run again, it will run B. If it gets run again, then runs A. Pretty simple, right? How could we use it here? We can change our play pickup sound. And do we have a volume multiplier here? It's really loud, this 0 0.2. I will, I will put it like this. And we can, well, flip flop between two sounds, right? Sounds like a good idea to have a little, a, a little, more spiciness and a diverse behavior, right? So here I'm gonna copy and paste the same thing. And instead of using the explosion cue, there was a collapse one that it was also too loud, but with the volume multiplier, we should be fine. So let's try it, play. nice and we can we can see the execution here let's try it again and now it's different pretty cool right something to take in account because otherwise this video would finish that flip-flop doesn't um, save states like global states if i use this one the other one then it will also play the explosion and if I escape from it, I, if I close the, the execution and then play it again, it will always run A. So whenever this blueprint gets created, it will always run A first. And if we wanted to know which one is running, then we could use this output pin to know if we're running A or if we're running B. Just to take in consideration when using flip-flop it isn't the state base, like it only cares of the the run, uh, the first run, right? So if we are trying to toggle visibility using flip flop and your visibility isn't in the right state, then it will won't work like you expect it to. But for simple stuff like this, it's really easy to use. The next node in our flow category that we're gonna use is the do once or do n. In this case, let's let's use them. Do once and do n. These nodes they just um, do the stuff you tell them to do the number of times you need them to do. For example, do once will only allow the completed pin to be executed once. And you can tell it to start closed or start open. If it's a start closed, then it won't play unless you reset it. Right? So if my if this explosion queue resets it, then I could hook it up right here and then it will be open for the next execution the do n works similarly 
but you can set up a number of times. You, you are allowing it to execute, for example, two times. If it enters a third time, then it won't play. It won't execute the exit node. And you can also know how many times it is. It is has been executed. So for example, we already have here. Oh well, we, we don't have here. If we wanted uh, the animation of the respawn to play at the start, let's let's play it easily like this. Let's use the timeline, get and play it. And play from the start. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So the animation plays, right? What if we, I, if I wanted to apply here when it finishes, when the animation finishes, I wanted to have a particle effect that let me know that it has finished respawning, right? So here in finished, I could just type you know, emitter. Ah, there it is. A spawn emitter at location, I will put it. I I know I have an explosion here in the starter content that we imported at the start. And the location will be this actor location. And let's test it. Let's press play. And when the animation finish, it should... Yeah, that's right. It should play that emitter at the location perfect so what if i wanted to have this particle spawn at the start only at the start whenever the game starts and not when it respawns then i could use these do ones and i'm gonna copy it and paste it here finished and connect it like this. I will I will tell it to start open so, so it can execute once and then close forever. Then it plays one. If I pick this one up and then wait, it will play the animation, but it will not play the spawn emitter at location. If I wanted to do it a number of times, then I could use the do n here instead of the do once. And I can reset it. And for example, we could reset it how. Yeah, here, this collapse queue, this second collapse queue, reset it. You can connect it like this. I I wouldn't recommend it because it makes a mess of the nodes. Usually I I would do something like this. I would create a custom event. Reset VFX spawning something like this and here in the collapse queue I will call that reset VFX spawn so now we have it the first time we pick it up that didn't reset it so it won't play here but that one did, so it should play my particle effect again. So yeah, that's that's nice. That, that's nice to have. And if you needed to do do it a certain times, certain certain number of times, then you should be able to use that do n node. Let's talk about the gate. Let's create one gate. And this node will allow us to control also the flow of, of execution. We can start close or we can start open. And here we will have ways to first try to enter the gate. If it's closed, then this won't trigger. But if it's open, then I will be able to execute whatever code I have here connected to the exit. For example, if this spawn emitter at location was here, 
then we could use it if the gate is open. In this case, it is starting close. So, how would we open it? By connecting it this event. We can open it, close it, or toggle. Toggle is simple, right? If, we, if it's open, then close it, or if it's closed, then open it. Let's change a little bit how this works. And let's say I only want to spawn this VFX with the with this sound, this explosion cue. So let's let's delete the, the previous event and let's also delete the new ones. Let's change this custom event to open VFX gate. And we can also have a close. VFX gate. You can you can also use a toggle. I'm using both these of these events because I want it to, to look fancy. So now when it's finished, it will try to enter the gate. And we need to tell well it it, it is it is a starting close. So if we wanted to open it here, open, close gate, we could create another another event for a toggle. But using the open and close also give us the benefit that we will always know that if we call open, we're open it. If we just had a, a toggle event, then yeah, we, we told it to toggle, but we didn't know the starting, the starting condition, right? We didn't know if it was close or open. So here we make sure that we are open it or closing it. And now I want it to open when the explosion plays. Open VFX gate or close it when it doesn't play the sound I want it. So let's play. That open the gate should play my VFX event. That isn't the sound I want I wanted, so that closed the gate. So nothing plays. You will, you will be able to find more uses here for this gate. This is a really simple use, a really simple use case. But for now, I believe that the idea is understood. The last notes we should talk about here on the, on the topic of ways to control the execution flow should be the loops. We will have here four loops. and a while loop. A for loop will execute something for a number of times. For example, if my first index is zero and my last index is also zero, then it will execute once. Because when we, whenever we're working with indexes, our indexes usually start at one, at zero. So if I put here one, this is executing two times. If I put here three, this is executing four times. So if I wanted, for example, four spawnings, I could do it like this, but I would not be able to see the difference because this for loop will execute all the loop body in the same frame and that this is not exactly what we want to do if we wanted to play one after another maybe we could create a delay here but it things get complicated real fast now we also mentioned that we had a while loop and this while loop is really really dangerous why because it will execute this loop body after this condition becomes false. So it executes while this condition is true. So if you put this here 
and and I I I haven't done this in a while, so let's connect our while loop. Uh, let's let's connect it at the begin play just to get the effect like at the start. This while loop will execute this spawn emitter at location, but I'm never telling it to finish, so this becomes an infinite loop. So that's why it's really dangerous. And if you press play, let me save everything. Press play, you will get this effect. Hopefully, in Unreal 4, they oh, and my my CPU is starting to ramp up because it is executing. Yeah. So let me close it. Escape, escape, escape. In Unreal 4. There was a message, message here that the while didn't stop executing and it was taking too long. In Unreal 5, I do not know what would happen. But you, you will get to this, you will freeze your engine if you use a while loop without a condition. Oh, hope. Thankfully, my spamming escape managed to fix it. There it is. Infinite loop detected. And you can see the call stack here that is a while function branch. It takes me to a while loop. Then I, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know, I know that, that it was on purpose. So this becomes a, a potential bug that could lock up your game, make it. Uh, stay in a deadlock state so be really careful with the while loops you you need to in any and this is you is currently and most common commonly used in recursive function that we could talk a, a little more in other videos but it's really useful to have a while loop you just need to know where when to change this condition. Usually, uh, you will create a, a variable, and then here, after uh, something happens, you will set the condition to false, right? We could select something uh, like this. Let's let's create. Yeah, yes, so you know how to exit a while loop. For example, an integer. This integer. Let's compile it. And let's say that this integer, if it is more than three, so something like this, if it's greater than three, three, greater than three, then this becomes true and this sets the condition to false so the while loop ends and here I just need to add a value to my to my new new variable something like this one so now our loop can can execute fully without having to slow down our engine and potentially crashing it. So let's delete all this loop while loop stuff. What I wanted to do with the loop portion of the of the video is using a for loop. And that for loop, where is it? Here we will have a number of execution that we can define, right? And it's going to be really useful in the construction script that we have talked about already. And here we are setting up the relative scale. I should really clean this up in another video, but for now, let's leave it like this. We have a number of coins we, we want to give. We can make more coins appear. So why don't we do that? Here, I will use, uh, let me delete this new variable and this condition. We already have a 
number of coins. And here I will do a for loop. And that's a for each loop that it works with arrays that we haven't touched yet. So for now, let's use the for loop, the simple one. We have a first index, we have a last index. If I connect it like this, if the number of coins to give is two, then it will execute the zero and the one and the two. So it executes three times, which it isn't something that we want. I can fix it if I put the first index to one or if you are if you already have a little programming background and you are used to indexes starting in zero, then you can subtract one. And that will make it better. But for readability sake, and it's easier to, it's less node to use. Let me put one. So that's great. Now we have a loop that it's running the number of the times of the number of coins to give. I want to add more coins. Here is an static mesh coin, a static mesh component. I'm sorry. We can add components. So let's add it. Let's add component and I can't add a component. Well, we can find the component we need is an static mesh. And let me let me type add static mesh component. Here it is. I will connect it like this. And I need to give it a relative transform, otherwise it will give me errors. Ah, it didn't give me errors. That's that's cool. With this node selected, here in the detail panel, I need to find my coin. Uh, I will, for now, create a sphere. Or well, I le yeah, let me create this this same coin. It's a cylinder. I'm clicking clicking browse, and here I'm clicking the use and it didn't work why can i type cylinder yeah here it is and now it is creating because it's in the construction script it it has already run because it changed so i can see the creation in the viewport i'm only seeing one i can change it to maybe three but they are still being created and i don't know why my my coin disappear this one it is it is still being created in the same place so that's why we're having uh, that little issue so let's change the relative transform let's make it and in the location i'm gonna for now, put it to the right. So I'm going to add a value. Uh, let, let me split this location. In X, I want to add some value. So I'm going to use this index because the index, um, for example, one. And uh, now, yeah, let, let's add the logic and then explain the, the er error I just seen. So let's multiply it by any value. I'm gonna connect it like this. And yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm gonna promote this to a variable. This will be space between coins. This space between coins, I'm gonna multiply it by the index. So now, if the index is one, then 
I'm using the space between coins. If the index is 2, then it's the space between coins multiplied by 2. Let's compile it, save it. Um, oh, um, I'm not seeing it because my space between coins is 0 right now. I could put 20. And there it is. I could put maybe 30. 50. So yeah, now if I increase this number of coins to give, I can add more coins. Right? Pretty good. So let's leave it like this. Um, the, the error here is that if I did not have this coin at the start location, then you will see that, uh, let me increase the space between this, that the first object is not being created at the start. So that's why it is useful to have all my indices here at zero and then do the minus, the subtraction here minus one and then the first object will be index zero which means that it will be the space time zero which is zero so yeah now in my viewport my procedural ge uh, generation that we, we could call this is working correctly now For now, I would leave it like this. We will clean up this blueprint in the future. Don't, don't worry. I wanted to clean this coin generation before moving on. Here we have it like it spawns sequentially, which is not something I, that I want. So let's go the, to the construction script. First, let's make it look like our coin here. Our coin is using this basic shape material. So let's browse to it and use it. If <laughs> if it didn't pick it up, let's see, content drawer, basic shape material. Now it should be able to be used. Now let's change how we're spawning it. No, let's let's change the scale. Here my static mesh coin has 0 0.25 we have the same now compile before now it's looking like a coin let's spawn more than one so i can see it there it is and we need to rotate it it should be something like minus 90 and minus 90 oh well it the coin, it looks the same from both sides, so I could have used positive rotation. So here it is, my coin. Great. Now I can change also how it, it's going to be spawned. Instead of using this respawn highest rotation value. Oh, no, that's not it. Construction, this space between the coins. I can... Disconnect it. Here, I'm going to use something called random point in bounding box. And we're, we have already like a bounding box, but it's a sphere. But we only need the origin position that we can get like this. Get word, get world location and the box extent can be the ra radius, but maybe it would be too much. Let's get the radius, get radius, a scaled radius sphere in, in case this blueprint gets scaled in uh, during the game. And I'm gonna divide it by two. Oh, that's by 20, that's not it, by two. And I'm gonna fit it to the box extent and this to the origin. And now I can 
recombine my location and pass it this value. And it should look something like this. Yeah, and I'm dividing it because I already did tests and it was too much. Now, let's see how it looks. Now, I'm getting a random position in my in my blueprint and I'm making sure that it is facing this way in positive x because that is commonly known as the front of any blueprint and maybe they, they are too big right so I can also change this scale and I could use the index no, no. let's not complicate it uh, uh, too much let's let's put zero point yeah the same value for everyone if it's too little then yeah it's too little then by half should be fine yeah, and that didn't change weird and this also should be by half so I can get the same width compile it here it is number of coins to give Yeah, and we have a coin that disappears uh, because our uh, our previous logic that we will definitely change when we talk about um, when we talk about data structure. But for now, this has been a good cleanup. Now it looks really nice, really cool, and it it gets spawned like. Now I have like more than one coin, right? So it looks pretty nice. Let's talk about common data structures. There are a lot of ways that we can store data inside Unreal Engine. And this will, makes, will make our development easier and will make our game Compatible for a type of game that is really, really useful to have, that is a data-driven game. It's easier to make changes in a data-driven game than in a game where all the values are spread around. The first type of data structure we're going to talk about are enumerators or enums. We can create enums like this. Let's go to our blueprint folder, right-click blueprints here we have enumeration what's an enum an enum is just a a file that stores values from 0 to 255 so we can use those values to save usually states because an enum cannot be more than one value. So in our case, here in the construction script, we have like a number of coins to give and based on that number, we had determined that one was this size, the option five was this other size and the option 10 was this one. But this leads to some problems because, well, we need to check every option, right? So we can solve this and instead of having a number drive that value, we can use an enumerator. Let's double click and we will call this coin size or coin bundle would be better. So E coin bundle. Now let's open it. double click it and we will have this empty enumerator we can give it a description and we can add more items here new and we will add four items it's a good practice for the first value of an any enumerator to be none just so we know that 
if the value is none, then we have not changed it. And it doesn't assume any other type, right? Because here I want to put a small, a small bundle. Here is a medium one. And here we will have a large one. So if it is none, then I have not selected property properly this property. So now in the BP coin pickup, we can use the enum instead of using this number of coins to give. We will have we will still have number of coins to give, but I will create a variable that it will be called coin size. Well, coin bundle size. Instead of it being an integer, I will select my enumerator. Pickup. How did I call it? E coin bundle. So here it should be E coin bundle. Now, if I compile, I can set up a value and I can use this, this variable to now select more values and it won't give me numbers, but it will give me the text. So I can press, I can type select and I could have a small, medium, large, etc. Let's connect it like this and we can give the same values we had here. So the small one was 1, 1, 0, 25. Medium was 125 in every one, in every element. And the large one was 10, 1 1.5. Now we have a cleaner implementation and it doesn't end there. We can delete this and the number of coins will be useful to us in order for us to give the, that number of coins to our character, right? But I wanted to have, I don't want it to be set by the, by the game designer. I, I just want the game designer to know that he can set the bundle size. So now let's check if this works. Compile, it shows nothing, but if I change the bundle size, it should change accordingly. Medium, large. Yeah, that's it. This is maybe too much. 0 0.5 maybe, and this one I will set it to 1.5. And now I want to set up this, this number also. Let's click on the eye so it isn't open. Let's open this one and we can set the number of coins to give the same way using the coin bundle size. Let's do a select. And let's open it. Let's connect it right here. Another thing you can do with enumerators is a switch, which it would be like having a branch, but that get gets chosen by an enumerator. So if it is none, it, it executes here. If it's small here, medium, large. So that's also pretty nice. Let's connect it like this. If it's none, then zero, small, one, medium 5 and large 10. We should probably make these values into a variable. For now, let's not worry too much about it. And now every time I set my value, my coin bundle, then it will also set up my number of coins I want to give. So now in my map, I can get it to change with this medium. This one I want large, 
so it, it changes and I'm having little differences with this value here and I should fix it probably so let's fix it let's fix it instead of doing it like this let's delete this space let's delete this also let's attach it to our to our to our coin because this is a relative transform now that I have seen it let's do a manual attachment let's press play let's see how it how it looks compile save now it should be using my yeah my word location yeah that's that's right because we were using a word location then now in when i'm using world or the scale now it's working properly yeah yeah because otherwise it was attaching attaching to itself and it i was giving more i it was inputting a relative transform but i was using a word location so it it, it wasn't giving me what i needed I could also solve it like this, I believe. Get relative transform. No, get relative lo location. And use that as the origin. Let's try it. Yeah, and it's it's the same. It was because I, I was using that word location that it was misbehaving. So now it is cleaner. I like it better and I could get rid of this static mesh coin because well we aren't oh, where is it uh, we are already creating a, a coin here but let's also fix another stuff yeah my spawn coins are not following my animation so Every time I, I add a static mesh component, I want to attach it. Attach the component. And here the parent I want to move. Well that I will that I'm already moving is the static mesh coin. So let's put it like this. Let's uh, keep relative. Yeah, it's it's fine, I believe. Play. Yeah, now it's working. And let's keep the word one in everything. So yeah, so the the location is is fine and the rotation also. Yeah, so that's that's better. The next data structure we should talk about is well structures, and we can create structures by going to our content drawer, right click, blueprints, and here I can select an structure. I want to create a structure and the most common functionality of it is that we can save properties that will be commonly used by classes. In this case, my class is a pickup, so let's create a structure for pickups. Now, here is important to define what will my pickups need, right? We can check on our, for example, properties here. What could I, could I put on my pickup structure, right? So maybe, did I save the respawn time? Time before respawning, yes. This is something that not only a coin will need, every pickup will need this and probably a uh, respawn and in play rate gold c location maybe but it's not mandatory because not every pickup will have an animation right and these variables if we right click find references are tied 
to my animation that we added here. So the only thing for now that will help me will be the time before respawning and maybe the the sphere radius but again maybe a pickup isn't defined by a sphere so uh, maybe we can it, it won't be good to store it on a structure so for now our structure will have this variable time before respawning let's open it and here we will have variables it already comes with a boolean but we don't want that we will have two variables one will be the one that we mentioned that it was the time before respawning it will be a float because it is the time before we respawn our pickup and it is usually a good idea to put inside an structure a way to identify whatever it is going to use it in our case it will be the name pickup name this can be a string because it will allow us to type a lot of stuff here type time before respawning i believe i'm using the default value of three and i can change the default values of these variables here three and now what could we do uh, with the name well we can for now let's call it pickup and I said it could be a string, but a string is usually reserved for operation that we do with characters because they are a, a string of characters and that is easy to make operations like split, append, etc. This is going to work as an identifier. So instead of using a string, we will use a name. And that's usually a type of variable that you want to use whenever you're, you want to identify something. In this case, I'm going to just put pickup name. Right. So now I have my structure here. With this structure, now I can add it to my blueprint of my pickup. So here in variables, I'm going to add um, pickup up base values maybe and I'm gonna change it to my structure pickups now this structure let me compile it and save I can set its default values here and I can call this pickup coins and change the time before respawning now we are not using any of these values so let's change them. Well, let's use them by changing our logic. We will find every every part the, of our code that is using the time before respawning. Find replaces. And here it is. So instead of using it like this, I'm going to drag and drop my structure, get it, and I can break this structure. Time before respawning. And now it will use the value inside my, my structure here. And now I can delete my time before respawning. Now, what if I wanted to change the value that I have saved inside this? Let's say that after, I don't know, let's call a delay here. After four seconds maybe maybe i want to change my my time before respawning well there are two ways you you could probably find this way where when i set my my structure and i replace all the values we just need to do something like this make and get the other values, but this will mean that I'm overwriting this pickup name. And if I forget to connect it 
connect it, it will give me a value that I do not need. In order to change only one property of my structure, what we can do is get the structure and set member. Now we have this node. We connect this node and we can select which one, which properties we want to change. So we wanted to change this time before respawning and we can change it here. If we needed the other one, then we can add it, but it's not mandatory to change every variable. Let's delete, delete this and, and this code. But with this structure, we have a base, uh, base values that our pickups can have in a orga organized way. If we needed to add more, I don't need to enter this blueprint. I just need to open this structure and add more. Then I could enter the blueprint and modify the logic as I need. The last data structure we will talk about, and there are more, but these three are the main ones. The next one is the data table. A data table will be uh, very similar to an Excel table, a spreadsheet, or a numbers table. So in order to create it, you need to have a structure. I already have my pickup structure that we created previously. So here in Blueprints, oh, it's not in Blueprints, it's in Miscellaneous. So here I will find my data table. It will ask me for a structure. I will pick my pickups. Okay, and what this created, I will call it DT for data table, and I will name it pickup info. I could also name it database, but uh, it will work almost as a database because here I will have a name, I will have a time before respawning, and I can add a new entry for the data table. Here in my pickup name, I could call it coins. And this is two. Maybe I want another pickup. Let's call it health. And this should, uh, should be delayed longer, right? Let's add another one. Um, armor. And this one will be even more. Like, I don't know, 15. Here we're adding stuff that we can later access by our blueprints. So we don't need to change it blueprint by blueprint. Whenever we create these other blueprints or pickups, the health pickup, armor pickup, or etc., we really do not need to, to enter this blueprint again we can get all the information for the data from the data table. We just need to make sure that this row name is being called something useful to us. You really do not want to call it one because this is the identifier of the table. So I will call it exactly the same as my pickup name. So now coins here health here and armor. Now let's use this information. Oh, it's, it's good to know also that I can import data. I can duplicate, paste, copy it. And if I wanted to export it from Unreal to any, anywhere else, I could go here to the data table, right click it and export as CSV or JSON. So I can export it. Uh, where is my, my project? Is Blueprints Quick Start here and call it Ah and save it. Let's open it. Uh, show in Explorer. This should open my Blueprint Quick Start and I have it right here. And I will open it as, an, as a text. And I have pickup name, time before respawning, coins, coins, the, the same stuff I have here. 
Now, we can use this information in our blueprint, right? We want to set up this, this structure because I already have that information in my data table. So in the construction script, I could set it up. Can I? I, I really... Well, you just need to use this node, get data table, or just type data table. Get data table row. Yeah, that's fine. Can I use also in the construction script? Yeah, I can. Yeah, it, it, it could be a good place to, to put it. So let's set it up here also. And because it's something more important than every everything else, let's call a sequence. The setup part should run first. Right. And then everything else from the blueprint should run later. Now we need a data table to call. Let's call our data pickup info. And here we can select which one of them I want. Coins, health, armor, whatever. Now, here we can, it will give us a row. In this case, our row will be a pickup structure. We can break it and we can get all the information. But because we already have an structure here that is being used in this data table, I can do it like this and it will set up all my values. Now we have a data driven game and there is none somewhere. Ah, there it is. A data driven game because if I wanted to change the, the logic, well, some of the behavior of the coin, for example, how many seconds I wanted to, to, where is it here? Respawn anim. No, this is the play rate. Where is my, did I know that expose it? Ah, I deleted it, right. If I wanted to change how many seconds I need before the time uh, ends and my pickup is respawned, then I can close everything. Uh, let me close everything. Yeah, if I pr press play, this works. This is this is still working. If I wanted more seconds, I do not need to open my coin pickup. I just need to open my data table. And I can change it if I need less time. 0 0.1. Save it. Play it. Oh, it didn't update. Maybe because it is in the construction script and now I'm running the construction script. Let's see if that, that was it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, so let's not put it in the construction script. Let's put it in the begin play. Because otherwise, if the construction script isn't run, then we're in trouble. Yeah, let's set it up like this. And now, now it, it shouldn't matter if I if I move my coin or not. If I needed a longer time, maybe five seconds, I just save the data table. And it will wait five seconds. So yeah, that works. That works pretty fine. Let's return it to one second. So it's faster. I just wanted to let you know that using data tables is a great way to get along with designers because they love tweaking tables and they really don't want to waste too much time finding here, entering the blueprints, searching for the variables that they need, changing them, seeing how they change, seeing if it, it affected something. 
they uh, at least in my experience they love data tables because it's a central place where you can edit information and as a as a um, as a little nugget of wisdom you shouldn't put assets here you can you can save textures here but if more blueprints are using that this data table then they will load all the assets that are here so it's best used if they are if these are only values right numbers text whatever you want but don't don't use reference to assets you can like i said but uh, just a friendly advice uh, try to avoid it <laughs>